guys, Dr. Ash back here to talk with you about central venous catheters. These are central lines, tunneled lines, importable plants, or implantable, <laughs> importable, implantable ports and pick lines. So let's get started on central lines because those tend to freak students out. So let's talk about those, all right? So what is the purpose? The purpose is to deliver hyperosmolar solutions. These are solutions that need to go into bigger vessels because our little bitty tiny hand and arm veins just can't handle it. Um, it may be that you have an ICU patient and we have to measure central venous pressures. That's outside of the concept of this talk and we'll be more in the ICU content as we get to it. Um, this patient may need parenteral nutrition. They may not be able to tolerate enteral, which is through the stomach, and may need parenteral, which is nutrition through an IV. And so a PICC line, a central line is actually absolutely perfect for that. Um, or it could be that you're in the ICU and you've got 20 drips. Yes, I said 20. Um, and as you can imagine, that's a compatibility nightmare. Um, and so oftentimes when we need to give multiple solutions, multiple medications, um, especially in the ICU setting, we will have a central line placed. They can also be placed for long-term use. So if our patient needs long-term antibiotics, they will tend to give um, central line access. If they need emergent hemodialysis, those are all reasons why we would place a central line. The important thing to remember is that the location, the position, if it's in the right spot, is determined by x-ray and that has to be done before we use that central line. So once a central line is placed, it is not immediately we get to use it, it is we confirm it on x-ray and then we can begin to use it. These can be uh, double, single, double, triple, I've had a quad in before, and that just means how many lines you have. So it can be one, two, three, or four in some instances, and sometimes patients have multiple central lines. So it just depends on really what's going on with your patient. The different insertion sites, it can be a, an IJ or an EJ, so internal jugular, external jugular. It can be subclavian, which is below the clavicle, so it gets inserted just below the clavicle. It can be femoral, which is down in our growing area, which is not ideal. It can be surgically tunneled. So they go to the operating room and they get it tunneled or they get an implanted port surgically placed, or it can be peripherally inserted. And that's usually either through the basilic vein in the middle of the arm, or it can be in a cephalic vein, which is a head vein uh, more common in babies. So here's a picture, and I like this picture because it actually shows you the different insertion sites. So you can see this one up here goes into that internal jugular and then comes down into the superior vena cava. The subclavian, the clavicle is hanging out right about here. You see that the subclavian is inserted and again goes down into the superior vena cava. We have a pick line that is inserted into the um, brachial or basilic vein, and it's going up into the superior vena cava. And if we have a femoral artery, this man happens to have a very tiny torso, but um, I guess it's for the picture purpose so he can get it in a smaller area. But you can see that it's inserted into the femoral vein, and then it goes into the inferior vena cava. So end result is we are trying to get into a much larger vessel to be able to circulate whatever medication that we're trying to give. And I caution you because, you know, there are Googles out there, right? Lots of Google stuff. And there are some pictures of where the tip of this catheter is actually in the right atria. And that is not what we want to do, not at all. This can actually cause atrial fibrillation. Um, it can cause all kinds of issues to happen with the heart. The heart does not like to be tickled by a plastic catheter um, or, flexible catheter. I'm not sure what they're made of these days. They used to be latex, but of course people have latex allergies now. Uh, but whatever this material is tends to tickle the SA node, which causes some issues with atrial um, contraction of the heart. And so we definitely don't want that tip to go into the right atrium. We definitely want it into that superior vena cava or inferior in the case of the femoral, but you can't really reach the right atrium very, very well. You'd have to like really tunnel in that femoral catheter. So let's talk about a tunneled central catheter because this is gonna be surgically implanted. 
because this is going to be more permanent. This is a long-term solution. It has less of an infection risk because you're actually taken to the patient to the OR. They are draped sterilely. The surgeon is sterile when it's placed, and so it has much less infection rate. Plus, it's tunneled. So basically what happens is there'll be a surgical incision just above the clavicle. Um, that is where they enter into the vena cava. They're going to insert the catheter into the vena cava, and then they're going to tunnel that catheter, which is where the tunnel comes in, underneath the subcutaneous tissue, and then it'll have an exit port somewhere mid-chest. These tunneled central catheters typically are accessed as needed because they are for more long-term use. And as you know, as our patients kind of get better and they move to long-term antibiotics, it's more intermittently used versus continuously used. Typically the central um, tunneled central catheters are gonna be flushed either with heparin or normal saline, just depends on the provider's preference and maybe what gets ordered how often medication is given, things of that nature. So there's a picture of your tunneled up here at the top. Um, this is the patch kind of where they um, opened up to put the catheter into the vena cava, tunneled under the skin into an exit port here. All right, next we have the implanted port. This is surgically placed under the skin. They're often called portacasts, infusiports, or metaports. These are actually very good for the long-term chemotherapy um, for our cancer patients or our leukemia patients, they often will implant a port because they need frequent um, IV access. And so this actually requires you to be able to fill that port, palpate that port just under the skin. And so you can kind of see where it's raised here on this picture, right there is where the port is. And you should be able to feel and it's really interesting whenever you feel it for the first time. I encourage you, if you get that opportunity um, in clinical, to go ahead and go for it, um, to palpate that because it does, it does feel very different. Um, but we access that port with using a Hubber needle. And basically, it's just a large bore needle that just goes into the skin. It's usually at a 90 degree angle um, and it connects to a port which you can use to infuse. But the thing is, because it is surgically implanted, it is spot on. So if you do not get blood return, do not use it. Okay, so there must be blood return. If there's not, it's either clotted or it's not in the right spot. And that's when we got to call somebody um, because we cannot just randomly infuse a fluid if we are not 100% sure this port is where it is supposed to be. Um, unlike the external catheters, you can look at the markings on it, you can see what the measurement is at, you can do a lot of other things to assess the placement um, without being too concerned over where it's at, get another chest x-ray, but these ports are a little bit different and so we have to have that blood return. Typically it is flushed with heparin because it's usually only accessed once a day or maybe even every other day, just depending on what the orders are for the patient. So we definitely want to flush with heparin so that we do not lose this port. Next, we have my favorite, which is the PIC line. It's a peripherally inserted central catheter. And this is good for long-term use and at-home use, typically inserted into a basilic or cephalic vein, and it's threaded to the superior vena cava. Again, we do not want to go into the atria. Uh, that's a no-no. Um, it's inserted by a trained RN, which is probably why it's one of my favorite lines. It has to be flushed, okay, between uses. So if I'm using a PIC line for just an antibiotic every eight hours, as soon as that antibiotic is done, I should be in that room and flushing that catheter. So they have to be seen immediately. Um, oftentimes, I put a timer on my watch so I knew exactly when I needed to be back in that room in order to um, flush the line, okay? So flush it immediately after the infusion. Two important measurements that we have to have whenever the peripheral catheter, the PIC line is inserted. We need the upper arm circumference. So how round is the upper arm? And then we wanna know the upper external or the marking of the external spot of the PIC line. And that's gonna tell us two things. 
the upper arm circumference should be done once a shift because that is your first indication of a thrombophlebitis. We look for upper arm swelling, okay? That is your number one sign that there's either thrombophlebitis going on or there's an infiltration going on. So upper arm circumference. The external spot of the pick line tells you if it moves, which is important because we typically don't suture or um, tie down the pick line. There's usually just a dressing over it. So we have to be very, very careful that we know exactly where that pick line spot is at. We want to avoid heavy lifting in that pick arm because it can be dislodged. We have three complications, three top complications of a pick line, thrombophlebitis, phlebitis, and infection, okay? Because typically we are allowing them to go home with a pick line. So <laughs> infection is going to be a high risk. And then the other thing that a lot of nurses, I see this mistake happen very often, please don't be that nurse, but we have to use only 10 ml syringes, okay? And that's because our 3 ml syringe, our 5 ml syringes, they actually have a lot of pressure behind them. If you ever just kind of like pull back the plunger and snap it, you can kind of hear how much pressure is involved in those smaller barrel syringes. And so they can actually rupture the catheter. And so only, only, only 10 milliliter syringes. All right, we also have something that's called a central line bundle before I let you go. And this is to prevent infections, all right? There's typically a checklist during insertion. And basically you're checking off saying that the provider has um, done hand hygiene. They have sterile gloves on, a sterile gown, a sterile mask. It's under sterile environment everyone present in the room during the insertion has a mask on because we don't wanna breathe out um, anything that would cause infection. Make sure that the hand hygiene is done by the provider before they get in their sterile garb. So before insertion and anytime we go to touch a central line, we should be doing hand hygiene. The provider will typically use chlorhexidine to disinfect the skin wherever the insertion site will be. We want to use preferred sites, okay? And what that means is uh, jugular or subclavian is much cleaner. It's in a better site than the femoral, right? The femoral's got the hip. It's got the groin area, which tends to be the dirty area of the body. And so we really rather have it in a cleaner spot up on the neck or the subclavian area. We also review the need of the catheter daily. So do they still need the central line? Is the patient still qualified to have a central line or do we no longer need it? And then a sterile dressing is applied and typically the protocol for most facilities is that they change it every seven days or as needed. So, um, you know, as needed would be, it's not intact anymore, the line got wet, um, any, any reason at all. And anytime you open up that dressing to do a change, you definitely need a mask on for sure. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about here is the opportunity for an air embolus. So anytime we have an upper body central catheter, so this is um, the jugular and the subclavian that I'm talking about, those tend to have a higher risk of air embolus because of the pressure that changes with accessing and deaccessing that line. Now, our lines that are below the level of the heart, like the pick line or the femoral line, these risks are much lower, okay? So there is perks to having lines in certain areas. But if I'm gonna connect, disconnect or reconnect any sort of tubing or lines, I'm actually gonna have the client perform the Valsalva maneuver. So I want them to hold their breath and bear down like they're having a bowel movement. Um, and that actually lowers the pressure in the chest. So when you access that port, it's less likely to suck in air. We also, as a general practice, want to use the slide clamp and we should close that line off when not in use. We should not leave that line open. That's probably the most common thing I see at the bedside that drives me crazy. Like they should be clamped closed. Um, and then, of course, the other thing you can do is you can actually have your patient lie flat if they can tolerate it 
while you're changing the tubing because that will also equalize the pressure in the chest. And guys, that's it for central lines. You have made it through. It's really not that bad. Um, I will see you guys in another episode. Remember to like, comment, and share if you find it helpful.